Justin Miller, Rockstar College Physics here, and we are ready to do some stuff. So what stuff, you may ask? Well, let's check this out. So we can keep on looking at some charges, immersed in magnetic fields, and see what kind of pops on out. So let's consider a nice case of a moving charge that's all just by itself, moving through free space, some constant velocity V, and then all of a sudden, a magnetic field switches on. We're going to take the magnetic field to be a uniform, constant magnetic field, definitely not time varying, and definitely um, spatially static. So consider this. Consider a moving charge. Positive moving charge, plus Q. Moving with a constant velocity V hat. So we can just kind of draw this out. I'll take it like right here. Let's just say that this charge is moving like this. Nice constant V hat. But, all of a sudden, suddenly, a uniform magnetic field appears. Surrounding the charge. So maybe over dramatizing things a little bit and how would just a uniform magnetic field appear? I'm not worried about that. Let's just say that this happens. Somebody flips a switch, turns on the magnetic field switch, and all of a sudden, boom, there's a magnetic field. We're going to say that that magnetic field is directed into the board. I've already said that it's uniform. Same magnitude, same direction everywhere. So I'm going to draw this in just as a bunch of X's. I'm not going to put the little O's, but I'm just going to do this. X, 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 Say that this is B hat. What direction is that? That is into the board. And we want to know what happens. So, poof! There it is. Does anything happen? Well, the question really becomes is there going to be a force exerted on this charge that's moving with this velocity V? And the answer is, well, is the magnetic field perpendicular to the direction of the object's motion? And the answer is, yeah, yeah, holy. So what happens then? Well, let's look at this kind of a step-by-step -step here. We've got ourselves, this charge is moving that way. We've got that the magnetic field is into the board, which then says that there is a magnetic field force exerted on this charge that is upward. It's right here, right when the field switches on, we've got that there is this magnetic field force upward. Bam, that it feels. Now let's assume that there's no other forces being exerted on this charge. After all, it's just moving along at some constant velocity through free space. There it goes. What's going to happen to it? Well, it's moving along, right? And then something starts kind of pushing it up or pulling it up. There's these, this interaction, this magnetic field force. Is that way? What's that going to do? Well, it doesn't just make the charge automatically start moving straight up. The charge is already moving this way, but it will change the direction that it's moving. It will, in essence, deflect this charge. So change the trajectory of it. So this charge starts to move like this due to this force. And let's say at some other time, this charge is like this. What direction is it moving now? Well, the direction that it's moving is always tangent to the path that it makes through space. So when it gets to here, the direction that it's moving is more like this. 
So the question now is, what direction is the magnetic field force? Is it still straight up? And the answer to that is, no, it's not. It's not straight up. Why? Well, now the charge is moving this way. So we have V crossed into B is that way now. That's the direction of the force. There we go. Well, what do we have? Well, the charge is moving this way. Something is kind of pulling it or pushing it, deflecting it this way now. What's it going to do? It's going to continue to undergo a change in its trajectory. So what does it do now? Well, it keeps on doing this. Sometime it's up here, moving in this direction. What direction is the magnetic field force now? Well, now it's in this way. which makes it continue to deflect this way. And by now, hopefully you can kind of see what's this gonna do. It's gonna trace out this sort of circular path. The charge is gonna occupy these different points in space as it goes around, but it's going to be such that the magnetic field force is, that's right, radially inward. Radio inward here at all positions of the charge. Well, what can we get out of this? We can get that this force here, this magnetic field force being radio inward, is substantiating that's right, the centripetal force. C hat. Well, what do we know about F sub C in general? We know that the magnitude of the centripetal force can be written a couple different ways, but commonly mv squared over r, where r is the radius of the curved path. Radius of the circle in this case. M is the mass of the charge, and v is the speed that it's moving through. It's always moving with the speed v, it's just changing its direction because of the centripetal force acting on it, because of the magnetic field force acting on it. So this is what we end up getting out of this. Well, there's the magnitude of the centripetal force, and we know that the magnitude of the magnetic field force is equal to q v b, absolute value of q, times v times b, times the sine of theta, I'll write that in times the sine of theta, but theta is equal to 90 degrees here. At all locations, the magnetic field is inward and the velocity vector is in the plane of the board. They're always at 90 degrees with respect to one another. Sine of 90 is equal to one, so that term just kind of goes away. So what do we get out of this? We get that the magnetic field force is substantiating the centripetal force. So we have that F sub B must be equal to S sub C, their magnitudes, which gives us that Q times V times B must be equal to M V squared over R. And what can we do with this? Well, we could solve this out for R. So we get that one factor of V is going to go away. And we could write this out as R is equal to M times V divided by absolute value of Q times B. What is this? Well, this says that if we have a charge Q with a mass M moving at a speed V through a magnetic field that's uniform with a strength of B, that's perpendicular to V as well, then the radius of the curved path of that particle is going to be equal to r. That's right. Pretty cool, huh? 
what do we end up getting here in this specific case, where just all, all of a sudden turns on? We get ourselves uniform circular motion. There's no increase in its speed, there's no change in its kinetic energy, there's no work being done. Why? Because the force is always perpendicular to the direction that the charge is being displaced. And for there to be non-zero work, producing a change in kinetic energy, we have to have a portion of the force would be in the direction of the displacement, which is not the case here. Magnetic fields do no work on moving charges, because the force is always perpendicular to the direction of displacement. So that's something that kind of falls out of um, cross products and stuff. But this is known as the cyclotron equation. And well, what's the cyclotron? Cyclotron is ultimately this system here, where you take yourselves a charged particle, you inject it into a uniform magnetic field, and you get that it exhibits uniform circular motion, and this is the correlation between the radius of curvature, the mass, the velocity, the charge, and the magnetic field strength. So R equals radius of path, in this case, circular path. M is the mass of charge Q. B is the magnetic field strength. V is the speed of the charge. And Q, we've already said, is the charge of the charge. So there we go. So if you know four of these quantities, you can figure out what the other one is. You say, well, that seems pretty cool. Right on. So what we want to be able to do is use this, do something with it. Because it's a pretty cool effect, right? Pretty cool indeed. And a pretty simplistic expression as well. Maybe some engineers can develop some sort of equipment that can be used to figure something out about a given system based upon this. And the answer to that, well, not really the answer to it, the, uh, the outcome of that is, yeah, it's been done. Heard of a mass spectrometer before? Maybe, maybe not. What does a mass spectrometer do? Well, if it takes some sample that has some particles, different, well, everything's made of elements, right? All these different elements, or maybe it's all the same elements. It somehow atomizes and ionizes those elements, producing ions and then it thrusts them into a magnetic field in which they undergo deflections and if you can measure the deflection, if you know what the magnetic field strength is, you know what the speed of the particle is, and you have some idea of what amount of charge that particle has, you can figure out what the mass of that particle is. And that happens to be really important because if you can figure out the mass of the particle, you can start figuring out compositions of materials percentages of different compounds or different elements producing compounds and basically map out what something's made of. What is this composed of? What's inside this? So that's what we want to look at here is a simplified version of a mass spectrometer um, as they're actually pretty complicated at this point, but you can still build a simple mass spectrometer that allows us to understand some things. So that's what we want to do now. All right, be right back. All right, so we want to go ahead and look at a mass spectrometer or some variation of a mass spectrometer. So ultimately, mass spectrometer's job is to figure out compositions of some sample. And composition, we mean element-wise, which can be correlated with compounds and basically, hey, what's this made of and how much of what? What we want to look at specifically is figuring out the mass of individual particles that are within some sort of substance. So, generally speaking, what a mass spectrometer does initially is it injects some sample into the system and there's some mechanism that allows that sample to become ionized, electrons stripped off. 
And that happens in various ways, but a lot of times they're using a plasma flame. So they digest some material or some substance in an acid that breaks it all down, and then they inject that substance into a plasma flame, which then ionizes the particles and kind of shoots them out. And in that shooting out of the particles, you've got yourself some moving charges. So what we want to be able to do is understand how those moving charges then interact with the mass spectrometer so that we can figure out what the masses of those individual particles are. So <clears throat> we're just going to go ahead and say, hey, we've got two main parts of the mass spectrometer. Two main parts of the mass. Whoa, whoa. One is called the velocity selector. And the other is the deflection chamber. And what we want to be able to do is note that R is equal to MV over QB, utilizing the cyclotron equation in order to figure out, again, the mass. So we could rearrange this and say the mass of some particle that has a charge Q, the rate of curvature R speed V in a magnetic field B is then given by QRB divided by so if we can figure out what these four quantities are here, we can then determine what the mass is. So these two components or parts of the mass spectrometer will allow us to do that. So the velocity selector allows us to know the speed or speeds the charges of the charges Q. The deflection chamber allows us to measure the radii curvatures of the charges magnetic field. The magnetic field is something that we can control. We haven't gotten into controlling magnetic fields, but just take it for granted that we can determine or control what the magnetic field is at given locations in space. And that'll come with time, but this is something that we control. So we can control B we can determine what V is, we can measure out what R, the radius of curvature is. The last thing to note is what is the charge of the particle? And then we're in the position where we can figure out what M is. Well, Q can only take on certain values. Generally, moving electrons, Q is equal to N times E. E is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 volts. Right? The charge of an electron positive. So we remove one electron off, we will have we'll have that the charge is then equal to 1.602 times 10 to 19 coulombs. We remove two electrons, two times this, three electrons, three times that, four electrons, four times that, and so on. This can be dealt with statistically. 
and by the notion of, yeah, we can only have certain, um, certain values of Q, and they're all integer multiples of E. So that can be dealt with. So that's how Q is ultimately uh, utilized here, measured, so to say. So then, what we want to be able to understand then is those two parts. How do we, or how does the velocity selector allow us to know the speed of the particle? And how does the deflection chamber allow us to measure the radii of curvature of the particle? So the deflection chamber. allows a particle with a certain speed to make it make it all the way through. We control what that certain speed is. The question is how, right? How do you control the speed? So I'm going to draw out just kind of a little beginning diagram here. So we can say this is like a plasma flame. Take some sample into the plasma flame, and what does this do? It shoots out a bunch of these particles, high speed, different velocities though, all over the place, a whole bunch of charges kind of flying out. particles with various velocities ejected from this plasma flame. What we have here is draw a little kind of dashed line here. It's this. This is a very simplified um, version of it, but this is what we're going to say is the velocity selector. Like we said, the particle with a certain velocity will make it through, all the way through. So, first off, it has to be on this line. There's going to be so many particles in a given amount of, in a given sample, there's going to be a nice distribution um, of how many are directed this way statistically, and then you'll have a bunch of different speeds that they have, but only the one with a certain speed will enter and exit like this. All others that do not have the certain speed will not make it through. So, well, how are you gonna make that happen? The answer to that is we're gonna have force being exerted on these charges. So what sort of forces can we have exerted on a charged particle? Well, we can have a magnetic field force, right? Heck yeah, we can. What happens if I go ahead and stick in a magnetic field within this velocity selector? So let's say that there is a magnetic field in here. I'm just going to put it drawn into the board. We'll take a uniform magnetic field. So again, we can control magnetic fields, you can take that for granted, and we stick out a magnetic field in there. What's going to happen as a charged particle moves through this velocity selector now? Well, we have positive charges, we have that they're moving this way, if they enter, now there's a magnetic field that is into the board. What's the direction of the magnetic field force on one of these charged particles as this enters? Up. 
What's going to happen to it? It's going to undergo deflection upwards. It's not going to come out this end. Well, that's just with the magnetic field in there, which again depends on the speed of speed of the particle. The faster it's going, the stronger the magnetic field force, the greater the deflection is going to be. So that is a velocity dependent force there, right? Indeed. Can we stick another force in here? Hmm. What other kinds of interactions might we have with the charged particle? What else can exert a force on a charged particle? That's right, electric fields. We can produce electric fields. What happens if I throw an electric field in here? And say, excuse me, and say that the direction of the electric field force is going to oppose the direction of the magnetic field force. And if those two forces are equal to one another, then the charge has a net force of zero acting on it and makes it straight on through. So let's do this. What direction would I have to have an electric field within this velocity selector such that the force on it is in the opposite direction of the magnetic field force? Well, the magnetic field is into the board, but the force is upward. So we want another force to be downward. So you look at this. Here's our charged particle. It's moving this way. We would have ourselves F hat sub B is up. We want another force, F hat sub E downward. And note that particle that makes through has a net force of sigma F hat is equal to F hat sub B plus F hat sub E, which has to be equal to zero. If the electric field force is greater, it's going to deflect down. If the magnetic field force is greater, it's going to deflect up. If the force is zero, it just goes straight on through. All right, so how does this pick out particular velocity or allow us to determine the velocity? Well, it comes down to this, right? So we already know that we've got them arranged so that they're in opposite directions. There's the electric field that we need for positive charge. Electric field force would be downward. And we then note that we need F hat sub E, just the magnitude. The magnitude of the force of the electric field is due to the magnitude of the force of the magnetic field, because we've got opposition in their directions here. When that's the case, the net force is equal to zero, that particular charge makes it all the way through. So what is this? Well, the magnitude of the electric field force is equal to Q times the magnitude of the electric field itself. The magnitude of the magnetic field force is Q V B. Sine of theta and our orientation here, theta is 90 degrees. Velocity is that way, magnetic, magnetic fields into the board, 90 degree angle between them. So this just resolves down to here. So what do we end up with here? Well, we end up with the electric field strength having to be equal to the speed of the particle multiplied by the magnetic field strength for the net force to be equal to zero. Well, that gives us something. Particle, I should, I should really say charge, it makes it through undeflected. field strength to the magnetic field strength. That comes from right here. Solve this up for V. So we can control the electric field strength. We can control the magnetic field strength. The ratio of those two determines the speed of the particle that makes it through undeflected. 
because when it's traveling with that given speed, the net force on it will be equal to zero. If it's traveling slower than that speed, we will have that the electric field force is greater and the particle will deflect downward. We have that if it's going faster than that speed, the magnetic force will be greater and it will reflect upward, not making it through. That one particular speed allows it to go through unchanged in its path and unchanged in its speed. So then we know what the speed of that particle is. So we've got this. Great. Then what? Well, then that particle enters what's known as the deflection chamber. And the deflection chamber is where the measurement of the radius of curvature happens. And that's pretty straightforward there. I'm going to erase this part right here because we just stick in our deflection chamber. Deflection chamber. What's in the deflection chamber? A magnetic field. Let's just stick the magnetic field in being the same orientation as that in the velocity selector. Not necessary, but we'll just stick a magnetic field in like this. And what happens? Hey, we got this charged particle enters a magnetic field B having a speed V. So we've got this particle then continues to go, enters like this, interacts then with the magnetic field, and what is it going to do? It's going to do something like that, where there's the R, the radius of curvature. How does the machine measure what that radius of curvature is? Hey, we just have a nice array of detectors here really finely spaced and say this is where that particle struck. Produces a little current, senses it, and say, oh, that's a distance this away, which translates it into what the radius of curvature is. So here, array of detectors that allow us then to measure what R is. So what do we got? We control V, we control B, Q can be dealt with statistically, we measure R, we find M. Ta-da! Pretty cool, right? Now again, this is a very simplified version of a mass spectrometer. They really don't have uniform magnetic fields. They have like octopoles and stuff like this, but it's something that it sweeps through variations of magnetic field strength. It sweeps through variations of the combination of E and B, so you get a lot of different velocities going through, but it tracks it. It's got computers that can keep track of, of everything, so it knows at what point in time, what speed was let through, what the magnetic field was here. It correlates with it and does a whole bunch of computations for a large, large, large number of um, particles. And there you go. Here's the, the mass, the mass composition. Um, how much, how many, how many counts of that mass per, per overall counts, things like that. And there you go, you figure out what the composition of the material is. I like the velocity slick. That's just a cool idea. Somebody had to come up with that and say, hmm, how are we going to figure out how fast something is going to control? I know, we'll take a magnetic field and an electric field and stick it in there and have an entrance pupil and an exit pupil. And there we go, we got a velocity slick. Some, some brilliant thinking, brilliant. Anyways, that's kind of the, the mass spectrometer in a nutshell, simplified version, but version nonetheless. All right, so that's pretty much that. Have a good one, until next, take care.